thank you. Thank you very much for the kind words. Uh, definitely, it's a pleasure for me to be there. It's a kind of habit because it's the second time in a couple of months I'm coming to Alexandria. I just love the view. So this morning is just such a fantastic quality of life. And I really uh, thank you very much for sharing some information and experience about Trevita and these very strange views of taking shots for every month in the psychiatric disorder. So it's not exactly what we expected a couple of years ago. And I would like to show is, if yes or no, it is an advantage and where could we have some benefit of it? So this is the department where I'm working. Yeah, oops, that was not the best one. So this is the, this is the department, just like a butterfly, which is quite understandable for a psychiatric department. This is Satan Hospital. And the, uh, my department was initially led by uh, Delay and Deniker, who maybe, in fact, you might know, because they are led by the one inventing the first antipsychotic, the conventional clopromazine. So uh, we already have quite a large experience on antipsychotics in schizophrenia. The other point is that we are working in St. Anne Hospital. It's a very old hospital, 17th century, where initially patients were working within the farm of St. Anne. And we use all those chronic patients in order that they manage their time to have a more activity, not just staying in their room doing nothing. And that was initially already a kind of stimulation, working, doing something. Uh, training your brain, as you said, so important for those patients with schizophrenia. So I like these two aspects of treating patients with schizophrenia within our range. So before getting to why it might be interesting to use LAI. The first thing is, eventually, what are we using now is mainly oral antipsychotics. Uh, do we have good efficacy? Yes, we do. Because when you compare it to a placebo effect, all our antipsychotics have a very nice way to improve patients with schizophrenia. Very well. So why should we move from that? We have good results. And it should be completely recognized at that. And that's mainly for positive symptoms, hallucinations, bizarre behavior, and so on. But if you look at the statistical differences between these different antipsychotics, they're just the same. They're just the same. We do not have any kind of significant difference. And that's a very large meta-analysis, including a lot of trials, and especially randomized controlled trials. So I guess there's many clinicians in UN, and when we have a first patient, we take a long time to predict which treatment would fit each patient. But why do we do so? Because when you look at that, all of them are the same. So one hypothesis is that maybe relying only on positive symptoms is not enough. And in fact, we all know that usually when you put some antipsychotics, you're going to have a reduction of these positive symptoms. But that's the, not the only aim we have as clinicians. We want to improve the life of patients. And the life of patients is not only about positive symptoms, even though, of course, positive symptoms are important. So this is not enough for the, uh, the outcome. Is it enough for patients? Which is another point which might be interesting. Not at all. Have a look about this study where all patients were treated for a schizophrenic episode by an antipsychotic. After a year and a half, nearly all of them stop it. OK, so they have very good efficacy. They are rel relatively comparable. But all the patients stop their treatment. Definitely, there is a problem here that is not captured by the impact on positive symptoms. But you know, maybe we can say, oh, you know, patients, they have poor insights and, and poor compliance. And of course, they stop their treatment. So that might be because it's a chronic disorder and they are having this is over for a very long time. It is not, because if you just restrict to this UFES study, all of them being first episodes, it's exactly the same. The majority will stop their treatments even after a year. So even young patients with young disorder, they do not like their treatments. So that we have to maybe look other ways, just looking at reduction of positive symptoms in schizophrenia. Well, the, the point will be a lot about functioning, which is probably much more important in how the patient conceptualizes the impact of their disorder. 
that why, why did we use positive symptoms instead of functioning? Because we know that it's a kind of the end of the road. It's a difficult way and a long path in order to have an improvement of functionality. I think this study is very important. It just looked about, did we treat our patients as quick as possible with the most efficient treatment as possible? And we've been distinguished these two populations, looking at their improvement of functionality. All of them were largely improved. But for those for which you have a very good treatment because it was very quickly appropriate for each specific patient, they will have, at the end of the day, a much higher level of function than those that had took a, a bit too long in order to get the most appropriate treatments. And I really appreciate this study because, in fact, when you look at just a couple of years after your decision to treat or not, or to have a wait and see attitude, you will not see it immediately. That's not immediately obvious. It will need time in order to be translated into poorer or better function. And that's really about what we found in clinical activity. Very easy to reduce the PAT score of 15, but much more difficult to gain 10 points on the GAP score. But this is completely correlated by a different time frame. And if we stick to this one, we get closer to what patients expect, and then you would have larger differences between different treatments. And the result of that, when you get into functionality included in the outcome of patients, you get from efficacy to effectiveness. Effectiveness being efficacy in real life, in, in including all the aspects that are so important for patients. And as you just mentioned, it's not only about treatment response, it's about how you have a quality of remission, no remaining symptoms, how cognitions are being restored, and how we have a, a very good level of adherence and compliance and then a good efficacy and no too much depressive symptoms. All of them then will allow a good functionality recovery. The other aspect which is really nice when you shift from positive symptoms to functionality is that it probably captures what we're doing every day much more than just what are doing the RCTs. Why is it so? Because our practice in one visit takes about, I would say, 10 or 20% of our time devoted to which treatment is given, what are the side effects. But all the rest is part of it, completely independent. How are you functioning every day? How are your interactions? What are you doing now in your life? How many interactions, social interaction, are you able to develop, and how we can restore that? All of those aspects have an incredible impact on such a core social functioning, and it's not captured by just the level of prescription. So it's interesting because it reflects much more what we're doing in everyday practice, which is merging those two approaches in order to enhance as much as possible the chance to get to complete functional recovery. And this is important because all those approaches as psychotherapy, for example, cognitive behavioral therapy, the psychoeducation, which is a kind of mandatory for a new episode of schizophrenia, for a new patient with schizophrenia, for those with poor insight and definitely considering it as a symptom of schizophrenia, not as a barrier, then you need to increase the insight. And that is motivational interviewing that we use a lot in addiction. But it can be used also exactly the same as in So motivational interviewing definitely can be used in schizophrenia as it is in addictive disorders. And also for these more sensitive aspects of cognition. Thank you very much. Thank you. The metacognitive therapy is definitely also very important. All of these, they will enhance all the efficacy of a neuroleptics, antipsychotics, long-acting antipsychotics. And that is interesting because this is exactly what we do in everyday life. Just, just have a look at this one, because you know sometimes it's, it looks like it's a kind of a theoretical background. But this study, for example, even though it's a relatively small one, is really striking. Some of these patients were only treated by antipsychotics. Hello, sir, how are you? PAN score is 27, then you need three milligrams of this treatment. Bye bye. And the other one has been also associated with a psychoeducation program, or motivational interview, and usually about uh, remediation cognitive therapy. 
And if you have those two aspects being delivered together, you have an improvement of the risk of the relapses, you diminish it by three. But just have a look about, it's too low for me, the functional recovery. Functional recovery is half of them when you have both approaches. And it's only 3% when you only prescribe treatment. So you know we are losing chances when we only limit our activity on prescription. And for that, the best way to uh, put it really forward as a very important aspect of the benefit of it is looking at functionality, not only relapse, which are incidents that we should avoid, and not only about reduction of positive symptoms. Okay, so if functioning is so important, are we assessing functionality in our patients? Could you please, please be brave enough to raise your hand for those of you who rate the level of functionality in your patients? Okay, two. That, that's your largely above the average, which is everywhere zero. So congrats to you, because usually, you know, we have so many of these talks saying that, oh, you know, my instrument is the best in the world. You should absolutely use it. But if you have 25 of them, how am I going to spend my half an hour with my patient filling in 25 instruments? It's difficult. So, of course, it needs much more reorganization of how we deal our time. And, for example, in my department, patients are never filling any kind of instruments. But my patients, usually, uh, they are unlucky because they're treated by me. So they have to wait usually three quarters of an hour in the waiting room before getting to me. And then we give them a tablet and they do all the instruments before. And when they come to me, I already have the results because it's completely well organized. We're lucky because we have computers everywhere in the, in the hospital. And that's, that's saving time. And the patient, they love it. They love it because, you know, it's a bit for me just like when you see your cardiologist or your GP. They take the tension and say, you, you have 12, 8. Oh, that's very accurate. My, my health is fantastic. Are we doing that as clinicians? No, we say, I think you're better today. What does that mean exactly? So using instruments not only gives a kind of more uh, appearance of a more scientific approach, but also it helps a lot to capture the benefit of what we do. Are we able to demonstrate a lot about all the benefits of taking your treatment? Not really. We say, if you stop it, you're going to be re-hospitalized. You will have a relapse. You will go back to hospital. That's a threat. That's not a positive reassurance. And if you assess an instrument as short as possible, as quick as possible, you would say, well, I see that you have a 20 points improvement of your everyday functionality. That's a weapon. That's a fantastic asset that we should use with our patients because that's a positive message. You are getting back to your life. You are improving your functionality. And don't worry because when a patient has an acute episode, his quality of life, his functionality is zero. All these instruments are very sensitive to hospitalization. So you might use it, don't use it during your visit. It's really too boring or time consuming, but you have instruments that are very easy to use. That's one of them, which is the Minifrox, an instrument we've been developing in France. It has initially 19 items. We limit it now to only four items, three minutes, and this is very sensitive to past remission, to the length of the present remission, and also to presence or absence of relapse. So it's sensitive, time sensitive, and, and improvement sensitive. So we have a large, easy way to uh, get back to the patient saying, yeah, yes, your life is improved thanks to what we do together. It's sensitive to clinical remission. It's highly sensitive to working activity. It's really sensitive also to being financially responsible of your, of your life. So it captures all the benefits of getting back to your own life. There's one important aspect that you definitely developed in the previous presentation, and I really liked it a lot. It's about we probably have still this idea that schizophrenia is a very severe chronic disorder with a bad prognosis. This was 50 years ago. Did we make progress? Enormously, enormously. When you look at the new studies on first episodes that are treated early, that, that's about more than 300 patients. Symptomatic recovery, 
Half of them. No more schizophrenic symptoms. That's incredible. And when you look at getting back to their life, as patients want, one out of three, it's not 5%, it's 30%. So we have a huge improvement as soon as we provide all the material that helps to treat patients very quickly. And of course, for those being completely restored with absolutely no remaining symptoms and high level of functioning and also high quality of life, okay, it's only 17%, relatively small. But these are really uh, completely cured as the schizophrenia didn't exist before, which is of course unconventional. So we treat patients. When we treat patients and we use LAI, are we going to avoid relapses? Maybe you know this study from Robin Hemsley in South Africa, where there were good responders with risperidone, they were then getting to LAI, and the level of relapses during this two-year protocol is equivalent to zero, completely stabilized by LAI. So it looks like it's fantastic. But you know, these guys, after two years, they say, okay, now, thank you, your treatment was very nice, but now I want to stop it. I have no more symptoms of schizophrenia. So what's the risk of relapse when you were having the first episode completely controls for two years? It's a huge one, 94%. Nearly all of them had a relapse, even though it was first episode completely controls for two years. So that means that two years is not enough. So of course the this question, I think you've been discussing that before, is how long then we should treat our patients. We don't know, but of course we have some cues about what it would be possible. What is, what is the price to pay when we uh, do not treat our patients too quickly, especially when we have the wait and see attitude that we had a lot in France, you know, saying for our first episode, not completely sure this is schizophrenia, maybe a bit too early to give antipsychotic to a young one like this, so maybe I will take my time. Maybe it could be a bipolar disorder later on, or personality disorder. I'm not completely sure. So I will not treat this episode. I will wait about just to, f to have more information about am I completely confident about the diagnosis. That's the kind of French wait and see attitude we had a lot before. Well, the point is then it means this first episode is not completely treated. And then the patient goes out. And the risk is that when the patient is treated then for the second episode, it's going to be much longer. And if you just do the same for the third episode, it's going to be even longer. So that means each episode worsen the prognosis of the next one. It means also on a positive, more positive aspect that each time you treat your patients quickly without waiting and see attitudes, and then you protect the patient for this very bad outcome where they will need for months in order to be relieved of their symptoms. I love this study because it was absolutely not the purpose of the, the design of the study, but it was in fact just looking at the impact of a polyparidone, either extended release or on the uh, uh, oral form, compared to lorzapine and placebo. And so of course we know that the PAN score really diminishes, and more with antipsychotics than placebo, not a surprise. But have a look now about functionality. And just take into account that in this design of study, some patients were not treated for six weeks because they had placebo. You know, it's usually not required now in Europe, but it's required a lot in the US for the Food and Drug Administration, so they had to do that for the five. Okay, so these patients, they were not treated even though they had symptoms of schizophrenia for six weeks. And then afterwards, of course, they are treated, and of course, they are improving their functionality with the PSP. But have a look about a year later. This patient that missed six weeks of treatment, a good, a good proxy of wait and see attitude, six weeks, no, I will think about it. I won't treat our patient too quickly. You miss six weeks of treatment. One year later, you lose five points of the PSP. They will not capture this delay of improvement even a year afterwards. This is chances that are lost to because we had six weeks of hesitation. I'm not sure I should improve it. My wait and see attitude will cost the patient five points, and that will not be captured with time because it's still there a year later on. 
So that's for me a very good uh, argument in which we should favor a very active, very immediate uh, activity of prescription. Another aspect for which it is really um, in accordance with the previous presentation on cognitions is about the role of uh, using your brain as a way to protect your personality from another episode relapse or acute episode. And this way is saying that when I stimulate my cognitions, I will protect my brain from an acute episode. That's another kind of a different philosophy between the US and Europe, where usually we prefer to get our patients not being uh, too quickly sent back to work after an acute episode. Usually we have a vocational approach. For these patients that have hospitalization, we see them back on visits, sometimes to daycare center, and we try to promote the patient to be sufficiently well to go back to work afterwards. In the US, they have an IPS attitude, which is completely different. The patient is out of the hospital, directly back to work. And then we try to help the patient to keep the job. It's a completely different attitude. Here, we are a bit careful. You know, our patients are very stressed. Professional surrounding is also very stressful, so it might be dangerous. And for them, they say, oh, no, 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 don't care about it. What is important is that the patients go back to life, excellent for self-esteem, good psychostimulation, and also they use all the um, references of everyday life, walking up in the morning, getting in the transport, seeing other workers, a lot of benefits. Which one is the best? That was the uh, study from Tom Burns, and it was a surprise for us, because our European very careful approach was negative. We had more hospitalization, and when the patient was hospitalized, they spend longer time at hospital. So we need that the patients get a lot of activity. The worst of all is being closed in a, a room in a hospital. No stimulation, really. So whatever we can do to stimulate our patients will decrease the risk of illness, not increase it. And as you just showed before, it's definitely interesting with this idea that in fact, the, the global um, organization and the course of disorder become relatively stable, usually after around 10 years. Of course, it depends on the patient. But after 10 years, usually we have two, three, or four uh, acute episodes, and then the things are relatively stable. And the main idea there is to say that we systematically decrease the quality of the outcome each time we have a relapse. And then, the consequence of that is that if I avoid each episode, each relapse, I will then get a stabilization much higher for the global outcome. And that's the explanation why I should be active and promote an active, an active treatment and have also whatever I can do to avoid relapses as soon as possible. Because that will, of course, will be the relief immediately, but it will change the long term. How could that be? I mean, what is the scientific background for that? We have more and more evidence now that, of course, schizophrenia is toxic for the brain. We already knew that. That's the uh, demencia precox that was initially uh, described for schizophrenia. But now we have more and more evidence that uh, the, the brain tissue is being damaged in patients with schizophrenia. But, and that was the two new findings, where what is explaining the toxicity within the brain of schizophrenia is acute symptoms, relapses. Not, not the global disorder, but when you have this kind of storm in your head where because you have hallucinations and negative symptoms and, and there's no proper connections that are really uh, physiological. And that is losing the white and gray matter. And this is interesting because if it's because of the uh, uh, length of episodes, then that means that avoiding episodes that will protect the brain of my patient. And that is not only this Andreasen study, it's also that with the, uh, the, the one done in uh, Poland, where they show also that the more you treat your patients, the more stable it is using the treatment, the less decrease you will have of brain tissue. And that is interesting because 
In fact, antipsychotics, they do reduce the brain. Now, that's a lot of message that we have in the lay press, but that's wrong. Age is explaining lo uh, losing brain, but antipsychotics are protecting the brain of losing weight. So, all of it means that using LAA as quickly as possible, especially in the first episode, we should then protect the patient as soon as possible to have a much higher uh, and better outcome. Are we using LAA in our private practice? Yes, but you know, probably on a limited part of our patients. What is the amount of patients with schizophrenia that should be treated as soon as first episode with LAR? My feeling is 100%. How many of my patients with first episodes are being proposed LAI? 100%. Are they all accepting? No, of course not. We know it's not so easy. And so what, what are the limits of these LAI for first episodes? The clinician, us, we are the limit. The more you have knowledge and confidence, the more you have positive attitudes, the more patients accept it. And so when it's well organized, very clear with your own evidence for that, then it's much easier. We are the barrier. It's not the patients, it's usually us. Yes, but you know, with the LAI, they have a shot, and then they have the treatment for one month. And so what happens if I have one effect side? I will not be able to reduce the drug because he's got it already in the blood for a month. No, no, that's not true. That's not true. When you look at side effects with the LAI, either they are exactly similar, or they are lower than with all the ones. We do not have more side effects with the LAI. Second point is, are, is it efficacious? Do we have a real impact? So on RCTs, a, a, little bit, a lot of limitations and sometimes difficult. So if you look at very uh, simple outcomes, such as just avoiding hospitalization, yes it is. You significantly reduce the risk of, of getting back to hospital when you are being treated by LEI compared to tr treated by oral forms. Okay, but then, can we have some more evidence about do are we really protecting not only hospitalization but just an, an, an episode or a, um, a just a relapse? It is, and that's a very nice study that was recently published on the whole population, all the Danish population, millions of inhabitants. And when you use it very regularly, then you have no more relapses. And systematically, the longer duration you have, with more acute interruption of your treatment, you systematically increase the risk of relapse. And that's interesting because that's even up to five years, meaning that there's a lot of uh, time to, be, to protect our patient, which is needed. It's not only a couple of months or years. Okay, but then, you know, for patients, it's sometimes difficult to talk about uh, the threat of uh, relapse or hospitalization. You can do even worse with death. As you know, when you have schizophrenia, it means you're gonna lose 11 years of your life. This disorder is a cost of 11 years. It's a huge impact on the, on the maximum risk of death. And so this study, once again, it's on the Danish population, so these studies are really nice because it's a fantastically statistical power. And they've been looking about if my patient is being treated by a conventional oral antipsychotic, neuroleptic. Am I improving his risk of dying too quickly? Yes, it does. You reduce it by 25%. Great. If I get to second generation, do I have a benefit? Are they going to have more possibility to live older? They do, because you get them to a, a reduced risk of, of death. Okay, but then, if I get to long acting, are you able to demonstrate that I'm going to have a positive impact on this premature risk of death, I do. And this is especially true for second generation. So you know, this kind of very strong scientific evidence clearly show that as more you protect your patients, the more benefit you will have. And when you look at these different treatments, you can see that for those that are more second generation than first generation, and especially for those that are being very active on the long term, you will continue to have a positive outcome on the uh, global risk 
of death for this patient. And that's the case for Sustena, which is definitely even better compared to the other ones. So why those metalysis on RCT, randomized controlled trials for uh, LAI, are not systematically uh, in favor of uh, a reduction of the PAN score? Well, the point is you lose one of the most important benefits, which is compliance, and we know it's much better. Because in these RCT, you need to make an injection also for those to buy an oral form. So of course, it's difficult to compare. Uh, we usually, it's difficult to start an LAR with remaining on an oral antipsychotic. So that means yeah, the design is really complex. And it's, of course, not uh, measuring all the real life benefit where you have an intermediate compliance in the majority of patients. But then how? How can we have all this benefit of LAI compared to oral forms? That's probably for me the most convincing study showing that. Because for this study, it was exactly the same molecule. All patients were treated by Risperidone. All of them. Half of them were treated by the oral form every day, twice a day. And the other one were treated by LAI for exactly the same molecule. You follow these first episode patients because this is where you are going to have a more, it will be more easy to show some benefits. You compare it with healthy participants and you follow your patients for six months. And then what do you see as what will be the chance of getting exactly the same molecule as an LAI as an oral form? Well, you're going to protect your risk of losing white matter in your brain. That, that's that's statistically significant. Are we happy with the fact that you protect through white matter? Well, okay, that's science. You know, for my patients, I'm not sure they're going to like it very much. Okay, but then have a look about what is correlated with this white matter which is lost during the follow-up. It is highly significantly correlated with the quickness of your activity. It's a very simple task where you tap your top fingers as quickly as possible on the table. This very simple task is completely correlated to the integrity of the white matter. And so getting more LAI means more white protection is higher speed of your cognitive process. And this is, of course, a big chance when you go back to work because you will be very quickly responsive, very quickly reactive, and then you will have higher chance of getting to functional recovery. So that's probably a very good way to demonstrate the benefits of LAI. So we know that nearly 100% of guidance and guidelines papers, uh, they explain that LAI are very good for those poor compliance with many relapses or with aggressive behaviors. This is really common of a lot of guidance. But this is, this is 20 years ago. And now we have four, including the French one, clear, clearly stating that the LAR are indicated as soon as the first episode. And this is the way we should move. Uh, don't tell that to my patient, but I have, have three children. Uh, if one of my kids would have developed schizophrenia, I would pray to two hours after the diagnosis of schizophrenia, not of course, just an episode. As soon as the diagnosis is proposed to be treated by LAI. Because that's the only way to protect this very fragile brain in such a very specific aspect of your life. Which is, which is teenagers. So whom are we proposing LAI? Well, these ones, non-compliance, lots of relapses, difficult to treat patients. Okay, that's, that's been done for years. What is the benefit of LAI? Well, not so striking. Well, not a surprise. These patients usually are the most difficult to treat. And so it was a way to avoid being able to recognize the benefit of LAI. And now we're shifting to a more interested, higher insight patients for which the benefit is going to be much easier to, to demonstrate. So just to, um, to see how we do propose that in saint Anne for, for LAI, as I said that all the patients that get in my, in my department, all of them, especially first episodes, we have a specific program for that, are being proposed LAI. So we give pros and cons, and we try to be completely honest about that, so that the patient decide, because they make the decisions, not us, at, and knowing all the benefits. You will not miss a pill, which is nice, because in fact, you might 
it might be a, a very important difficulty when you are treating everyday patients. It will modify the daily conflict. Should I take it? Maybe tomorrow I will take more. Don't forget that sometimes patients take more than we prescribe because they feel anxious in a more timely, adequate way because that will be very easy to manage. No more pressure from the carers. And that's so important for the families. That's why for the fathers and the, and the mothers and the sisters and brothers, we try systematically to explain that. You will not have to ask, hello darling, how are you this morning? Did you take a pill? Which is a kind of song that the patient hate. They are not just eaters pills. They are mainly uh, the son or uh, the brother. They want to be addressed just as usual family members, not as I have a disorder. More stable pharmacokinetics, possibly to take every day, nothing. This is something I like to push for my patients, saying that if we are, because it's usually not directly, we need a little bit of time, sometimes you need a little bit of benzo, antidepressants, or maybe adding an oral antipsychotic, sometimes it happens. But after a couple of weeks or months, you will take nothing. And believe me, for the patient, it's really destigmatization process. There is less risk of relapse. We now are able to say so because we have the scientific evidence, which is the enemy, short and long-term consequences. In my department, we do not have any paper work now. It's only on screens and computers. And so what we're writing in our computer is seen by the patient because we want to be completely transparent with the patient. And so we show all those information and we explain the study and we ask the patient, what do you conclude? And this is really helping, it's the kind of psychoeducation process. Higher chances to improve functioning as we should. If decision to stop one month later, this is something for me is extremely important. We systematically associated higher compliance with LAI compared to all forms. For me, it's not a good idea. It's not a good idea. Because when you do that, it, it looks like with the LAI, I'm sure you will take it. No, 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 no. You prescribe LAI, you know it's going to be not known by the nurse who, do, who does the injection, but the patient might not show up, and he will have no shot, and then the compliance will be completely aborted. So it's exactly the same. The only point is, you have to decide it once a month, and not every day or twice a day when you take a treatment. So it's much easier to manage this difficulty of compliance, but it's exactly the way the patient can stop whenever they want. And that's very important to explain that. It's not a commitment, not a judge, they're not a prison. They will have a good decision and they will see the benefit of it. And if not, they stop it. If decision to stop, medical staff will be aware. That's important. And we tell the patients, you know, you will do your shot in our daycare center. If you do not show up, we will be really, um, we will feel uncomfortable with the point that you do not come. So you will have a phone call, and we will try to promote why it is important to have your treatment. But you have the decision. So we want to be very transparent for that, because this is a good process. But the good point is the patient here that, yes, they can stop their treatment. The injection might be painful, but this is definitely not the case compared to the uh, last ones. So what we do when we have this decision to make it, we never do that before seven, five days of positive treatment, for which we have confidence that the treatment has good efficacy. Don't prescribe LAI with a not so clear benefit. Not the day before the leaving hospital. We want that for first episode, the patient does the first injection within hospital, because that's the best way that we have all the, uh, the feedback of the patient, so that we can understand then uh, what are the problems and how to deal with that. We devote a specific visit for that, one for the diagnosis, because as it's a first episode, we have to talk about, I'm afraid that it's not depression, it looks like it's schizophrenia. Wow, that's bad news, because it has a very negative a stigmatization image. And if you collapse that, if you merge this news with the point that I'm going to give you a shot for the next 10 years, that's a bit too much for one single person. So when you make two different visits about what is schizophrenia and, and that you have 50% of symptomatic remission after three years, which means no more remaining symptoms, so now it's much better, and you explain all about what is schizophrenia and you have another visit about, and now what are we going to do? And that's an important one because then it's not collapsing this negative aspects of schizophrenia. 
and we give a fair explanation of the different treatment strategies. And what we're doing now is shared decision making in schizophrenia in, in all patients, in fact, in my department. Which means I never, <coughs> never take the decision of a specific treatment for my patients. Not anymore. I always propose two alternatives, sometimes three. Usually two is better. And so the patient decides which one is going to take. And of course, for these first episodes, we propose either LAI or oral ones. Of course, I'm pushing a little bit for LAI to be completely honest, but I want it to be the decision of the patient. And if the patient says no, we respect what the patient asks for. Because we know that if we push too much, the patient then very polite will say, OK, doctor, thank you, doctor, I do it, doctor. And then three months later, he will be back because he stopped his treatment. We take time and we involve a lot of family. The family are fantastic assets in this decision process because they know it's going to be a relief for them not to look at the treatment being given every day. Uh, we have this family discussion with all the family members. And the last argument we use, which is for me a big advantage because this is really working well, we, uh, we have a lot of patients saying, well, it looks nice, but I'm not sure I'm going to do it. Let's begin with well, oral forms, because when, I, when it's LAI, I'm afraid we're going to take that for 10 years. So what we say is that we're going to make a contract. If you accept to take LAI, you will do it for three months. And have a go. Because, you know, when I show this study showing that patients are usually frightened before and very satisfied afterwards. And so it wouldn't be the same for you. There's no reason why it should be different. But after three months, if you say, I don't like it, I want to get back to oral, then we do it. And what I'm saying that is that it's a commitment. We write it on the file, and we will exactly do what we propose. And believe me, 70 or 80% of patients, they say, OK, I might try, but I can tell you after three months, I will stop. And all these patients, usually, they will keep it up, because getting to no treatment every day, they love it. And so it's a good way, probably, to promote this possibility of LAI. And for those patients after three months saying, I want to go back to all ones, we do it, because it's important that patients, you know, they talk together. And if they know that you're not reliable, we would have no positive uh, assessments after this. So we have now this chance to get a treatment which is not every month, but every three months, the PP3M, which is getting closer to this concept that you need a treatment that covers this very vulnerable period of between 20 and 30 for schizophrenia, and having as less impact on your everyday life. And with four shots a year, it's definitely an advantage. So you, here you have the equivalence between 50 and 150. Uh, usually, the vast majority of my patients are being treated by 100 milligrams. And for females, maybe between more 50 and 75. Then, and then you have the equivalent for the dosage of Trilecta. What is interesting is that you are more and more destigmatization. You are getting this stigmatization because you have less and less interactions. Patients, they don't need to see you more than four times a year. That's incredible. It doesn't mean that you're not acting on the other way, on the other aspects, but that's not needed. So that's definitely an advantage. Are we having an advantage in reducing the relapses? Yes, of course. You double the risk of relapse when you stop Trivecta too quickly. So there's no doubt that it has a nice protection effect. Are we getting also um, a, a higher risk of side effects? Just imagine you have an acute side effect. You will take it for three months. What a nightmare. You have a list of 40 side effects in this big paper where you had hundreds of patients being treated. It was exactly the same, either for oral form or for uh, monthly uh, LAI compared to uh, three months. So it's not a problem of side effects. Is it a benefit for functionality? Yes, you are also facilitating the activity of a higher level of functioning, especially when it's being proposed for first episodes. And that's exactly what I said before. When you look at those people compared to first episodes, those that are going to have a higher level of PSP and functionality level will be these ones with a, with a good level of, uh, of treating earlier. And that, that's not the case for chronic patients. So as soon as you propose it, you will have higher chances of success. So I will conclude my presentation, 45 minutes exactly, so we may challenge the treatments for schizophrenia, because of course we have no value, we don't know exactly what it is. 
We have a lot of ideas, but we have no signature of the disorder. A lot of many risk factors have been involved. We have a low agreement on the con concept of functioning, which is not so easily being used, and they're not being rated the same way by patients and, and family members and caregivers. But this early dysfunction is increasing and is difficult to treat. However, increasing interest in more complete remission, no more remaining symptoms, more clues discovered such as the specific prevention, treating as early as possible. LAR are definitely helpful for that, better protecting the brain tissue, then the cognitions, and then at the end of the day, the functioning level. When you also avoid the cannabis, the hashish, the uh, substance abuse and compliance, definitely you facilitate this progress, and focusing on side effects is helpful because it will also facilitate overcompliance. Thank you very much. Martin.